Hello. Today we look at painting in the context of visual art. Painting is one of the practices. And painting goes, uh, the history of painting and the practice of painting goes long time back into the prehistoric times. So what is painting? Today we look at painting and different kinds of paintings that are done as well as different types and mediums and materials using which paintings have been done through various centuries and what kind of expressions uh, have been produced. So what is painting? Painting is a visual art consisting of an artistic composition made by applying paints on a surface. So for painting you need a, a flat surface on which you apply paint, right? Like drawing you need a surface, painting also needs a surface but when it comes to painting, painting is more evocative, painting has the potential to create more or to trigger emotional sensibilities. So painting is more complex a visual art than drawing. Drawing has its own interesting complexities. You, you have draw in complex drawings produced by artists, but painting is uh, pictorial, right? It has more colors. So it has a potential to evoke different uh, uh, emotional sensibilities in the viewer. When we look at painting, we feel more intensely and there are possibilities to, to, to feel intensely and pa painting is more expressive, right? So today we we'll look at the details of painting and this is one of the early examples of painting coming from France and if you know, painting is a form along with drawing, painting is a form which existed, which got formulated and used by men long before language was formed, long before words and letters were formulated or written, you know, long before sounds were organized into words. So painting is a form that was a communicative medium, com that through painting and through drawing, communication used to happen in the prehistoric times, before the scripture was formed, right, before the writing was formed. Painting was a very important medium of communication and this is one of the examples of such communication. This is a cave painting coming from France and you can see this is from 32,000 to 30,000 BCE. I mean, so, so many centuries back, painting existed and it had a particular role. So why did they do painting then? What was the purpose? Painting always had some kind of a purpose, sometimes emotional, or other times it had a sort of a communicative relevance. So this particular image that you're seeing is a cave painting of a bull, right? So in the caves of that time, an art historians thought, uh, proposed that, you know, these paintings, and there were thousands and thousands of such animals, particularly animal drawings and animal paintings were done. So these drawings and paintings uh, played a ritualistic significance. You know, they were used for rituals. What were the rituals they were doing then? They were doing this ritual before the hunt. So in these paintings, if you see, what you see is the representation of hunting animals. You have men, you have people hunting animals. And if you look at these paintings, human figures are drawn very schematically. Human figures are drawn in almost stick-like drawings. But when you look at animals, they are drawn with a very realistic feel to them. You have a good volume, good sense of volume, uh, a sense of animation and movement, right? During the hunt, while hunting happens, animals run around, right? So these paintings captured the movement of the animals. So the artists, they were not artists at that point of time, they were not called artists, they themselves did not know that they were artists. But anyway, they had a purpose for doing these paintings. So what are the materials they used? The materials were largely charcoal, that the coal that was available by burning. Uh, and these uh, caves, these cave paintings were very much inside, 
you know, very much inside the cave, very interiors of the cave where light could not reach easily. So they had to burn, they had to, you know, use fire. So coal was very much available to them and animal blood was another pigment. Along with animal blood, they also used to use uh, a sort of a natural, uh, natural earth materials that they used to get. So animal blood, animal fat for as an adhesive to stick, to make it stand. And these pigments, these images survived all these years because they were inside the caves, right? So this is one of the early examples of what we can say the practices of painting. And what purpose it served? It served a purpose of ritual hunt. They would conduct the hunt in the painting and with the belief that they will actually can hunt, I mean they can hunt the animal very easily. So the planning, it's, it worked as a kind of a plan. So you make a plan before you go to the hunt, right? So these paintings were like plans for them and they also had a ritualistic belief. So it was not just a plan but it also had a, uh, an element of belief embedded in it. So this is one example, this is another example and you can see the horse, it's more colorful. This is another cave from France, again of the same time period, the 30,000 BC, around 30,000 BC. Uh, the horse is moving and you can see arrows falling on it. You know, the marks that you see, at the, they are basically the suggestions of arrows or suggestions of spear or, or a tool that is, you know, uh, aimed at the horse. And the horse is painted with blood and fat and the body is drawn with charcoal. So you can see here, the animation of the horse is captured and the volume, the, the round quality, the round quality of the horse, the solidity of the horse is captured. So you can see by that, by that time, artists, I mean, the men of that time, the hunters, they could manage to capture, they could manage to understand the uh, importance of representation. They could understand how to represent these animals. You know, they knew how to draw and how to paint, but the purpose of drawing and painting that they did on, uh, on the surface of the cave is very different. So we, we have seen here one surface, which is the cave surface, right? And they would use the undulating surface of the cave because cave surface is not flat like paper. Cave surface is undulating, uneven. So they would use those undulating surfaces, undulating forms within the form of the animal. So they were quite intuitive in that sense, how to use the surface. So this is one surface on which charcoal, uh, blood, animal blood, animal fat, and the earth colors, the colors, the dry colors that were available uh, to them at that point of time, they used them. So. This is in India, this is in uh, Madhya Pradesh called Bhimbetka. There are a set of caves discovered uh, in this place called Bhimbetka and it is named Bhimbetka. Bhimbetka came from Bhim Baitak, Bhim, so the place where Bhim used to sit, that was the idea. So this, the, and the cave is named as Bhimbetka, that place, the name of the place is Bhimbetka and that same name is given to the caves. So this is again one of the early, again around 30,000, 40,000 BC, early examples, one of the early examples in India of cave paintings. And you can see here the figures, the human figures and the animal figures, you can see the same kind of themes here also, animal hunting, but also a sense of community. I mean, you have people in groups. So when you have people in groups in some certain, some activity, you can kind of assume that yeah they, they, they are representing a community so this here you can see uh, different narrative kind of forms and you can see uh, something like this and uh, uh, art historians have also uh, there are myths and stories uh, saying that Mahabharata is represented uh, in painting, in, uh, in cave painting, is represented here in Bhimbetka caves. And you can see this example where you have elephants and it is a war scene. You have people sitting on the elephants and 
you have people throwing arrows at other people so this is not hunt but this is war so war is a mo is is a later stage of human civilization than hunting so this is this as you can see is a later painting than the one that we have seen just before right so uh, even here they have used animal blood earth colors extensively uh, and you also have representations of people extensively unlike what we have seen in france so these again you have surface you have stone surface right so these are two very early examples of painting that existed before the formation of language before the formation of script right and so we have seen one surface we'll go ahead and then see further surfaces <coughs> of painting so let us look at what are the mediums materials and techniques of paintings how many ways paintings are done right so one of the early techniques is fresco when it comes to painting fresco is one of the early paintings uh, uh, painting techniques and within fresco you have two types and you have them here on the screen fresco buno and fresco seco and this the fresco buno and fresco seco or the, these two terms are italian terms right but it is used extensively throughout the world fresco buno is a technique where a mural is done when uh, it is done on wall right fresco is a mural technique mural is always done on the wall right so you all already have a wall on which you apply plaster lime plaster and fresco buno is a technique when you apply color on the wet lime plaster so what happens when you apply the color on wet lime plaster the color is absorbed by the lime pulp lime plaster so the color gets absorbed into the plaster and it stays for years and years you don't need to have an extra adhesive extra gum or extra medium to bind color with the surface right so the surface is already wet when the surface is wet you are applying color and the color gets into the surface you don't need an extra adhesive medium that is fresco buno and fresco buno is extensively used from let us say greek times and also ajanta is one of the examples ajanta elora and we have other south indian uh, examples like sitanavasal uh, lipakshi so fresco buno is a technique which is extensively used and which is why all these murals all these fresco murals still survive and we can see them another uh, technique within fresco is fresco seco fresco seco is a dry technique where when the wall is dry you apply color so when the wall is dry and you apply color for the color to stay on the wall you need a gum you need some medium which binds the color with the uh, wall surface so for that people use uh, egg egg uh, white or egg egg uh, egg yolk or glue or different kinds of oils so different traditions and different regions would have their own specific kinds of binding medium right so in the context of uh, egypt egypt is one of the early examples where you can see fresco seco you also have in italy uh, people have done fresco seco and also in india so different regions would use different kinds of binding material so these are two types within one technique one medium called fresco fresco buno and fresco seco and two different ways of painting this is one of the early examples of fresco uh, painting and this is old egyptian fresco right so this is as you can see on screen 2613 bc around that time so it still survives though in fragments it uh, the frescoes done during the egyptian times during those times still survive and as you can see here egyptian ways of painting and much of painting the painting examples of egypt come from the frescoes and uh, as you can see egyptian uh, technique and egyptian uh, style of painting is very different and very unique right so how do you see when you see it you see the 
face is shown on the side right face is shown in profile and the body is shown in the front right so when you stand when you turn your face but you cannot stand like that and the legs are shown in the side so it's a very difficult position and people cannot stand like it but they evolved this as a style because if you know painting or drawing profile is very easy and i'm sure you might have tried where if you if you want to draw a face you try to draw a profile because that is the easiest uh, way or method of drawing a human face and when you have to draw when you have to draw a body the torso the frontal is the most the frontal position is the most easiest position of human body to draw and similarly legs in the sideways so egyptian method of figure drawing is a combination of different views when you look at right and those the combination is determined or guided by the approach to drawing which is more easiest and which is more recognizable right so if you look more and more egyptian examples you can figure out how the same kind of figure is repeated the same technique or the same method of drawing is repeated Me method of figure drawing is repeated right so this is one of the early examples of uh, fresco paintings we have and this is little later this is in italy right this is a very great artist called giotto who is considered to be the father of renesa he uh, started painting in a particular manner using fresco he sort of extensively explored the fresco technique and fresco buono the wet on wet uh, technique the wet color on wet plaster so this is an example of uh, the renesa that which is uh, giotto's time is 13th century 12th 13th century so during that time he sort of revived fresco tradition and he painted extensively uh, christian themes right so this is an example of uh, his his painting and an example of fresco and you see here this particular technique uh, this particular painting is very different from what we have seen in the context of egyptian art here you have figures figures look more like uh they are animated they are uh it is uh, the theme of nativity it is uh, nativity means the birth of christ when christ was born and that is a moment which is called uh, nativity and you have angels coming on the top right so the figures look more human like unlike the egyptian figures here the figures look more voluminous more naturalistic more real than the schematic egyptian painting so this is one of the early uh, examples of the late medieval painting which is uh, the renesa painting in europe this is of the same time but little later than giotto and the figures you can see here are more elegant and you can see the light and shade and all these effects all these effects are created by using fresco technique and fresco as you can see wet on wet technique is uh, is a long time time taking uh, technique it takes a long time because you know the plaster has to dry and it takes really a long time so <clears throat> artist have to really calculate how much time and how he is going to organize the figures how he is going to organize the entire uh, environment as well as how he is going to organize the light so it is a very complicated technique which takes a long time to dry and long time to get the skill of painting in it so this is uh, the theme of annunciation annunciation is nothing but uh, an angel comes and discloses to mary that she is going to give birth to a child before her marriage right before uh, her marriage she is going to give birth to child so this story this particular uh, secret is revealed to mary and that moment is called annunciation and this is the moment that 
the artist Fra Angelico is representing. And this is painted in a monastery he was staying in. And monasteries were very important when it comes to uh, the spread of Christianity. And this painting makes an important uh, sort of a statement of religious belief uh, when it comes to Christianity. So as we go ahead, we can see, uh, let us take an example of Indian painting. Uh, for example, Ajanta Caves. And Ajanta Cave paintings are one of the early examples of uh, mural painting in India. And mural actually is the first technique of painting. And later you have different techniques that evolved and we'll look at them as we go ahead. So this is an example of Ajanta paintings. And Ajanta paintings, the figures are really elegant. The drawing is very skillful and very elegant line is used and the figures assume uh, liveliness, assume volume, solidity. It also has a sense of plasticity. Plasticity means the feel of flesh and blood as if they are living and they are also very expressive. So Ajanta artists could actually, you know, uh, capture to could actually represent all these qualities uh, during that time. So this is one of the examples and Ajanta technique of painting both in terms of the figure, color, light and shade as well as the very medium of applying uh, the colors onto the surface. The, uh, the technique of fresco is really complex and colors, for example, a color called lapis lazuli which it was a very costly color used to come from Middle East and outside India. So Ajanta artists have actually uh, uh, discovered the pigments around the region of Ajanta and they have used them, ground those colors and then uh, used for painting. So these are basically earth colors. They, are, they, they have made their own colors using whatever stone, uh, ground colors, earth colors that were available, different pigments that were available and they use them. So this is one of the early examples, the Ajanta painting uh, from India. And this is an artist who is uh, very famous, Michelangelo, and he painted some uh, the ceiling of Sistine Chapel. And this is a fragment of Sistine Chapel. This is called the creation of Adam. And he also used extensively the fresco technique for his painting and he explored uh, really extensively he explored different possibilities of painting fresco painting and he created a technique called uh, he used this the technique of drawing called foreshortening he is the uh, he's one of the first artists who has used foreshortening very successfully and here, what is foreshortening? If you look at the slide, look at the hand of Adam, the hand on which he is resting, his right hand. And if you look at the right hand, you can see that it is, it is foreshortened. You, know? you look at the palm on the reverse side and you look at the entire arm. You look at the entire arm. The, the method he is using in drawing that is nothing but foreshortening. So Michelangelo is a very important artist when it comes to painting, fresco painting in the context of Renaissance and he falls at the uh, time of high Renaissance around 16th century to 17th century. So we have seen fresco, we have seen cave painting and how natural colors, earth colors are used and animal blood, fat are used and we have seen different types of frescoes from different regions, Egypt, uh, Europe, uh, <coughs> Italy particularly and then also India. And now we'll move, an, uh, move towards another medium called encaustic painting. Encaustic painting is nothing but mixing pigment, the powder pigment with wax. And it was largely beeswax rather than paraffin wax because beeswax is more malleable. It, it doesn't break, it is not brittle. So pigment is mixed with beeswax and then applied. So again, uh, beeswax uh, is a different 
it has a different quality, it gets dried up, right? So the artist needs to understand how much time the pigment can stay liquid and then how to apply onto the surface. And the surface that is used for beeswax painting, that which is encaustic painting, is largely the wooden panel. So till now we have seen mural painting that is done on the wall, the surface was wall. Now we have seen another surface which is wooden panel and this is one of the examples of uh, encaustic painting. Again, encaustic painting was very popularly uh, done in Egypt. right? So we have examples coming uh, from Egypt of encaustic painting and this is one, uh, a mummy portrait. right? So on the uh, the mummies and, or on the coffins, what we call coffins, they used to uh, make these very realistic, very expressive paintings on the, uh, on the surface of the mummy. This is another example of encaustic painting. Uh, again, this is, a, this is uh, a Byzantine icon painting. This is called icon painting. The painting that you have seen earlier, this one, this is portrait. It is not icon painting, right? But an icon painting is nothing but if I give you an example, for example, you take the um, image of Lakshmi, right? Lakshmi has an iconography, right? She stands on a lotus, she holds a lotus and she gives you money, right? Or you take another example of uh, Saraswati or any god or goddesses. Every god and goddess in the context of India, Indian gods and goddess, they hold something. They have their own vehicles. They, so all these form their iconography, right? So icon paintings in the context of Christian religion, and this emerged around 6th, 7th century in Byzantine particularly, and it spreads throughout Europe. But Byzantine is the place which is uh, very famous and which still like artists still continue painting icon paintings. So encaustic is used for icon paintings also. This is one of the early icon paintings from 6th century um, of, uh, of one of the uh, in, uh, one of the saints and you see icon paintings are largely of uh, Virgin Mary and Christ or uh, saints largely or evangelists. So it was, it was meant for the religious purpose and not for anything else. So icon painting is meant for religious purpose. So this is one of the early examples of icon paintings where encaustic is used. So encaustic is a material which is used extensively during that time. And this particular image again is coming from a monastery from Egypt. So Egypt is a, is a place where uh, encaustic was extensively practiced and very skillful encaustic paintings could be seen from there. Right? So another medium, very important medium that you know cuts across different centuries is oil painting. Oil painting uh, spread throughout the world and it became an international medium very soon. So it's a process of painting with pigments that are bound with a medium of drying oil. Right? So oil should be in such a way or the oil that is used for uh, oil painting should have a character of drying. It should dry and form. Uh, it shouldn't stick after it gets dried. So linseed oil is used for uh, oil painting because linseed oil has a quality that as it dries, as it gets dried slowly, it becomes a transparent film. You know, it becomes it forms a film on the surface uh, on which you apply it, right? So if you mix pigments, if you mix powder pigments with linseed oil, what happens is that, for example, if you mix yellow powder with linseed oil and then you paint on the surface, it takes a week or four days or a 10 days. Within 10 days, it becomes dried and it doesn't come out of the surface because the linseed oil makes a film of the yellow color, right? So this character is used and explored by the artist called Jan Van Eyck. Jan Van Eyck is credited, credited with 
creation of or invention of oil painting. And by the invention of oil painting, the painting got revolutionized. It was the possibilities of painting were explored extensively and you could become, you could paint very complex and intricate forms uh, within painting. And this is one of the examples, one of the important examples of Jan van Eyck's painting called the Virgin of Chancellor Rollin. And if you look at this particular painting, you have Chancellor Rollin on the left side and here Virgin Mary standing, uh, sitting on the right side holding the Christ, right? Look at the entire room, the carpet, and the, the, the garments that Rowling as well as Mary is wearing, and the angels who are on the top. And the, you go back and then look at the opening, and you look at the landscape outside, and each and every object is very intricately painted. And this particular detail and intricacy could be possible because of the oil medium. It cannot be possible in fresco. It cannot be possible in encaustic because oil gives the artist that amount of time. Oil is a medium which takes a lot of time, a long time to dry, right? So you have a lot of time to paint more intricately, more detailedly, and you, it gives you that time to manipulate, you know, to paint more and more clear and detailed, intricate details. So this is, uh, so oil painting really revolutionized the method of painting, the kind of realism, the kind of detail that you can create. How do we understand it? So you have Mary placed on the right side and Rowling is approaching, is on the left side. And the artist has left, uh, the central space, the space in the middle, for the viewer to go out and look at the river as well as the landscape, the actual landscape of the Netherlands, right? Because the artist belongs belong to Netherlands. So here the planning, you know, is very interesting where you are looking at the interior, very richly decorated interior space, as well as after you spend time looking at the interior space, you are welcomed, you are allowed, you are left to go out, you know, out into the space, into outside. From inside, you go outside and look at the space outside, the environment outside. So to do that, to make that possible, the artist has actually composed figures in such a way that that space is available for the viewer. So composition here, you have two figures on either side balancing the painting. And in the center, you are allowed with this, as if you can actually walk through visually, virtually, you know, you can walk through this space and then go and then look at the back, what is happening. So it's a very interesting composition uh, by Van, Ock, uh, uh, Van Eyck. Another painting by the same artist, Jan Van Eyck, is the portrait of Arnold Finney and his wife. This is a wedding portrait. Uh, like, you know, during the time of wedding, photographs are taken nowadays. So during that time, only few people, only wealthy people could uh, ask an artist to paint, you know. So Jan Van Eyck was asked to paint by Arnold Finney. Germany, Arnold Finney was an Italian merchant, was a wealthy merchant, and that was the time where mercantile business was really expanding and Arnold Finney got uh, married and then during the, uh, to mark the moment of marriage, to make it as a memorable event in his life, he asked the artist to paint this portrait. Uh, so the portrait is not just a face, but you have the entire scene where Arnold Finney is there holding in a very delicate manner the hand of his newlywed wife, right? And look at uh, the way the composition is done here also. And this is an oil painting again, and you can see the detailed uh, treatment, you know, different objects are painted. It's not just two figures who are standing on either sides of the composition, balancing the entire composition, but, you know, you have uh, the slippers 
of the lady who is who just left and this leaving the slippers aside and standing separately means this is a sort of a ritualistic so it has a ritualistic significance and you have a dog over there and if you go back you have a very excusely painted um, chandelier the lantern actually the lantern on which you have candles and he's holding the hand and the very gesture of holding the hand creates a sort of an arc a reverse arc and through which you can go back and look at the convex mirror uh, on the wall and the convex mirror is also painted with very intricate detail right and all this detail the intricacy of the detail and the effect of light I and mean, this particular effect of light which has different variations of different colors you, you have different variations of green you have different variations of the red bed right behind her and you know you have different uh, intricate details of uh, other objects right so uh, oil painting oil as a medium really helps really gives the possibility for the artist to create many variations of one color create many variations of one particular hue so uh, this painting both compositionally as well as in terms of medium in terms of technique it is a very significant painting and we can understand both the techniques of oil painting and the potential of oil painting as well as the uh, sense of composition the complexity of composition that an artist can create and how the light is played light is affected the entire uh, space you know the very soft very beautiful light of the late morning or late evening so this is another example where oil painting oil medium is can be understood and the potential of oil medium can be understood this is a still life still life is a genre a genre is nothing but uh, a kind of painting or a kind of expression a category of expression a category of painting where still life is a category of painting landscape is another category of painting portrait painting is another category like that like like that you have different categories and these categories are termed uh, as genres so still life is a genre is the genre which emerges during baroque times in europe that which is around uh, late 16th early 17th century uh, so around 17th century largely and that also emerged in uh, in dutch uh, uh, so Dutch still life is very famous so Dutch artists have explored oil paints for painting still lives and this particular image that you have on screen it's a still life of nothing but food and objects you know the glassware a silver taza and oysters and you see the artist has used oil medium to paint these different objects the silver the transparency of the glass and the liquid in the glass uh, and the liquid in the goblet right the uh, as well as you have a fruit the lemon which is peeled off and you can see the inside of the lemon you have the shiny oysters you have the plates and each and every object from lemon oysters the silver taza to the um, the glass goblet you have each and every object is painted with its specific characteristic he has captured the real appeal real appearance of these objects and this is possible because oil paint as a medium provides this possibility to paint in such a detail in such kind of a realism so oil medium really has expanded the possibility of capturing the world into painting right so this is a very good example of the potential of oil painting oil paint till now we have seen when we have seen paintings the surface is very smoothly painted we don't see the pigment we don't see the color or the oil paint the paste the pigment on the surface so uh, oil paint at a later stage is used in a different manner and Rembrandt is one of the early artists 
who used oil paint in an impasto technique. Impasto technique means you paint uh, in such a way that you use dabs of color, the marks of color. You can see the texture of color as you can see on this in this slide where Rembrandt has painted his self-portrait but you can also see the brush marks, you can also see the marks of color, you can see the pigment, the material uh, color, the pigment of oil. So it is to kind of create a more intense emotion, it is to create a sense of flesh on the body, right? So oil paint also is being used in different, different manners where impasto technique is another important technique that oil painting makes it possible. Fresco doesn't make it possible. In fresco, you cannot have impasto effect. But oil paint, because of its quality, because the linseed oil, linseed oil becomes a film and it becomes thicker and it stays, it doesn't go away, it doesn't break. So, which is why oil paint gives this possibility to paint in impasto technique and this is one of the examples. And you have another important and very famous example, the Starry Night by uh, Van Gogh. Right? This is a very famous painting and people get to see them and there's a song also, the Starry Starry Night. So uh, when you look at this painting, the, you can actually see all the brush marks on the canvas, on the surface of the painting. And all these brush marks are really laid out thick, impasto with thick, uh, pigment you know so this is also an impasto technique and see who has used impasto technique when we look at it is the impressionists who have extensively used impasto technique you know the thick oil dabs the thick pigments and the thick oil paint dabs are used by impressionists and van gogh learned that technique from the impressionists and you can see here the different uh, visible brush marks and visible visible thick uh, paint on the surface of the canvas. So after oil painting, we can see watercolor. Watercolor is also a very important and very old technique, but within watercolor, you have different, different methods of painting. So one of the early ways of watercolor and one of the early ways of, uh, early techniques of using watercolors is opaque technique, or which is otherwise called gouache. So for example, the miniatures, the Indian miniatures from let us say 10th century, 11th century and later. Indian miniatures uh, and extensively in the 15th, 16th century and 17th century and it continues, the opaque and the gouache, what is called gouache. So Indian artists have used gouache extensively, right? And uh, the artists of other countries also have used and in Europe also artists have used gouache painting, gouache technique. Another technique is uh, transparent technique and transparent technique is very popular uh, where you don't mix white in it, you don't uh, mix, you don't create a body of paint but you use a very transparent layer of the pigment and you create images out of it and we'll see some of the examples. Another technique is wash technique. Wash technique is a technique where you apply the color uh, and let it dry and then you wash it so that what stays on the surface is a very few remnants of or very very faint appearance of the color and the body the particles of color gets washed away so you do it some 10 times or 20 times as a, whatever your requirement is so it creates a very interesting effect on the surface of the paper so we'll see some examples of wash painting also. Another technique is tempera painting. So tempera is uh, a process where you, it is a lengthy process where you can paint in layers, unlike gouache where you paint with a thick pigment. Uh, tempera is an opaque technique, but you paint in multiple layers. Maybe you paint, for example, if you're painting a tree, you paint the tree, the green color of the tree uh, maybe 10 times. So you are gradually increasing the intensity of green. So this gradual process is tempera process within watercolor. So for, for watercolor, uh, you need a binding. So what the tubes that we get, the watercolor tubes that we get, binding is already included in the tube. But 
generally traditionally watercolor are paint watercolor is painted using uh, powder colors right using earth colors prepared by the artists themselves so then they needed a binding material which is sometimes the gum sometimes the tamarind gum so different uh, binding materials are used so let us see some examples so this is a gouache painting this is an example uh, of painting by Nandalal Bose and as you can see the pigment is applied with a thick body you have a sense of the thick color th thick uh, application of color on the surface of the paper so where you don't see the paper behind the color right and the application is also not in that gradual manner like in the context of tempera but it is more bold and the pigment is more thicker this is the example this is an example of transparent watercolor so if you look at this painting uh, the paint is applied where the pigment is very less in the water so you have diluted the pigment and you have applied so if you look at the monkey monkey is painted with just one wash one uh, one wash of the brush one time of the brush and so it, it with the paint with the paper behind and this transparent watercolor by interacting with the paper it creates one of the hues one of the shades of the color or one of the tints of the color right so this is an example of transparent watercolor this is another example of transparent watercolor what happens in transparent watercolor is your paper gets interacted with the color your paper is not hidden so the color its shade or its tint or its hue is revealed with the interaction with paper behind so paper lends itself in watercolor it doesn't it is not only a surface on which you paint but paper interacts with the color that you apply on on onto it so the color of the paper the uh, whiteness of the paper comes through the color of the transparent watercolor that is very important like here if you look at the yellow that he's painted or the blues of the buffalo you have the transparent color but and the transparent color reveals the paper through it and it makes it look more fresh more vibrant this is another example where the paper is revealed to a lesser extent and quite a realistic painting but still white pigment is not used here the water color is applied in a transparent technique and you have more layers applied you have more darker shades applied but uh, thick pigment is not applied it is not opaque but this is transparent watercolor this is an example this particular image uh, that you see is an example of wash painting wash painting in India is uh, discover is created by uh, Abhinandana Tagore. Abhinandana Tagore sort of uh, invented wash technique in the early 1900s and this is an example where as I told you you apply the color and then you remove the color uh, by washing it so what stays on the paper uh, that you repeat that wash by applying and removing so you get a more mysterious effect within the painting you can create that mysterious effect and a very lyrical effect so if you want to create such effects you can use wash painting this is another example of uh, this is an example of tempera where the tempera is uh, again as I told you the tempera is a technique where you apply color in layers right one layer after another and you can decide according to the intensity of the color that you want the deeper red or deeper blue or deeper color according to the depth of the color that you want you can apply the number of layers this is by Neelima Sheikh and this is the same technique the, uh, the tempera on paper the tempera technique used by watercolor by Lalu Prasad Shah an important modern artist this is an example of miniature where again uh, the same technique of tempera is used and sometimes tempera sometimes gouache but so this is a type of painting so we have seen some of the modern paintings in the context of watercolor and this is 
uh, in the context of watercolor this is a painting that which is pre-modern which is a medieval painting and medieval painting is largely to do with uh, either kings uh, or kings lifestyle or kings history or the religious themes so this is a theme uh, this is a story of varaha avatara where vishnu is lifting the land li lifting the uh, bhudevi from the sea so this is an example of it and this is another example of watercolor but a miniature coming from uh, basholi himachal pradesh so this is durga right so durga is standing right in the center you have the flat background and you look at it the pigment is slightly transparent slightly opaque so the artist here has used both ways of painting using somewhere transparent technique and somewhere opaque technique so same durga you know mahishasura mardini when we look at the modern artist you know this is an artist the indian artist uh, of progressive uh, movement uh, called taib mehta is from bombay uh, so this is buffalo slayer buffalo slayer is nothing but mahishasura mardini the durga killing mahishasura and this is an example of acrylic painting acrylic paints uh, it's it's famous now it's popular acrylic medium acrylic came as an alternative to oil paints so oil paint would take days and days to dry up but acrylic paint would dry quickly like watercolor it would dry quickly so artists started using from the 60s and 70s um, they started using acrylic on canvas and acrylic on paper it's like watercolor but watercolor you can wash away after it gets dried but acrylic doesn't get uh, like it cannot be washed away it stays on the canvas or paper it's more like plastic layer on the surface of the canvas or the paper so we have few examples of acrylic uh, medium this is one this is a very famous artist sayed haider raza sh raza and this is a sort of an abstract painting that he did using acrylic on canvas and this is an, this is an example of abstract uh, painting and the composition is very abstractly done and it is more about the mood rather than what you see in the painting so after acrylic what we have another very important traditional medium is egg tempera so in the tempera process if you use egg either egg yolk or egg white it is called egg tempera egg uh, the white egg or the egg egg yolk it works as a binding material it works as a material that as a gum so traditionally egg yolk is used by the artist and it is in the modern times egg white is used by the artist to create an interesting impasto effect and this is a medieval um, egg tempera panel uh, saint catherine of alexandria it's again an icon painting as i was as we have seen some icon paintings earlier this is an icon painting and the painting uh, is done using egg uh, egg yolk the yellow part of egg uh, as the binding material uh, for the dry color this is uh, the another example of the same technique along with egg tempera the artist has used gold foil here gold leaf to make it more to make it look more uh, elegant and divine this is an example of egg tempera but where egg yolk is not used egg white is used so egg white is uh, has a quality that it gets dried very quickly it gets dried easily and it is more uh, it's not smooth when it gets dried so artists have m mixed the powder colors with egg white and they have created images so it creates a sense of texture a, an effect of texture on the surface of paper or canvas and this is one of the examples by kavita diaskar kavita diaskar is an exponent of egg tempera technique in india this is another example of the same technique by kavita diaskar srinivas achari who is a contemporary artist who also uses egg tempera extensively and in hyderabad only these two artists who are currently practicing at tempera uh, srinivas achari as well as uh, kavita diaskar and finally we we'll look at uh, a very traditional uh, technique called kalamkari kalamkari uh, is done on cloth 
and it is a dyeing technique rather than painting technique but the drawing that they do and the application of paint is more in the manner of you draw on the paper but the technique the emergence of color and the development of form on the surface of the cloth is very different from how it happens on the paper like you apply uh, and then you use different dyes so you have a complex process of multiple stages so you, we have seen today a variety of painting techniques painting processes from uh, prehistoric times to the contemporary times and from the modern ways of painting to a very traditional ways of painting so uh, painting is not something about representing the world but it the the technique the medium and the methods are very important when you look at painting when you do painting thank you